Hello everyone, this is John Buck, uh, back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, this one is an example showing uh, the discrete Fourier transform and when we have aliasing in time and when we don't based on how many samples we take in frequency. Uh, so again, you, this assumes you've seen the first two videos for today's class already, which is the overview of the discrete Fourier transform and then the DFT equations as well. Right, so uh, for this example that we're going to do both on, on paper and then in, in MATLAB computationally, I'm going to use this signal. This is a finite length signal like we talked about. And, and, and actually, uh, before I get ahead of myself here, let me look at, I'm going to have uh, two different examples of how I compute it. But this is, so I hear it to start with, I have this as our finite length signal. Where our, we go from 0 to 6, so it's a 7-point signal. So that already tells us that from what we've seen in the previous videos, I would need at least n equals 7 samples to avoid aliasing. So we're going to try this each direction and see what happens. But the first step is to say we need to find x of e to the j omega so we can compute samples and frequency. We're going to say, look at what happens if we evaluated x of e to the j omega for this signal at certain frequencies, you know, and we'll do it computationally in a minute. And, and the easiest way I know to do this is by using properties and well-known transforms, right? We could say, well, if I had this signal going from minus 3 to 3, right, then I would, I know from uh, table Fourier transforms in, in the book, that let's, let's say this is uh, S of n is equal to x of n plus 3. So I've moved x by 3 to the left. Right, so now it's symmetric. We can look on the table, and we know that this Fourier transform would be the uh, sine of, uh, what would it be? It would be uh, 7 halves omega over sine of omega over 2. And so we're saying, well, then, the x of n we want is this signal, S of n, shifted 3 to the right. And so that tells us that x of e to the j omega that we're interested in would be multiplied by a complex exponential. If we're shifting by 3, we'd have e to the minus j 3 omega times S of e to the j omega. And so I can plug those in and get that this will be e to the minus j omega times this discrete time sinc function, so 7 halves, sine of 7 halves omega over sine of omega over 2. So this is the Fourier transform. We're going to say, so suppose for the first case, I'm going to do this with n equals 5. That shouldn't be enough. I'd expect to see aliasing, right, because my original signal has seven points long, and I'm only taking five samples in frequency, right? If I do this, I'm going to evaluate that omega sub k is equal to 2 pi over 5, which is my n, times k, as k goes from 0 up to n minus 1, which would be 4 here, right? So I'd say I define, I could plug in to this equation, I'd say my x of k, just to be clear, this, since we're going to do two different sizes, I'll call it x sub 5 of k would be equal to e to the minus j replace omega. Oh, put the 3 in front. Clumsy. So 3 times, and I replace the omega by 2 pi over 5k. And then inside here, I have sine 7 halves times 2 pi over 5k over sine of omega over 2. And if I put, so if I evaluated this, I plugged in as k goes from 0 up to up to 4, right, I could find these five values. I could say let k equals 0, 1, 2, up to 4. Evaluate these and then plug them in to the synthesis equation. I'd get, we'll call it x5 of n, would be 1 fifth times the sum as uh, k goes from 0 to, again, synthesis equation, we're summing over k, k going from 0 to 4, of, I'm going to just write x5 of k, 
but I would have the values, I'd have evaluated this numerically, have those complex numbers, times e to the j, 2 pi over 5 kn. And I would look at this output, I would evaluate this output for five values. And we could go through all this and do the computation, but because of our understanding of sampling, we already know what's going to happen is that it's going to be, we're going to have aliasing. Right, so that, that I'm going to have copies of this shifted every five and they're going to fall on top of each other. Right, so when I do that, if I shifted this five to the left, this copy at five would end up at zero, six would end up at one. Same thing when I went five to the right, there would be overlap. Right, so I'd have a version of this that went zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so by sampling and frequency, I've made these copies in time. So this first one goes back here to minus five. And I add up all these copies to get the result. And I have another copy over here at plus 5 and, and at 10 and so on, but I'll just draw the first couple here. So I've, whoop, I'm just going to make this one red just to keep the copies distinct. I mean, in real life, you can't see the colors, but I'll use colors here to help make the pictures a little clearer what's going on. So I have this copy that's that got shifted by 5 to the right. Again, all these things are shifting by 5 because that's the number of samples I have in omega. So when I add all these up, what ends up happening? Well, again, I'm just going to mainly be interested in what's going on here from 0 to 4. I get 2. I get 1 plus 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And then here, these have all become 0 again. So I have 2 three and four are just height one. So I'd have two, two, one, one, one. I should have labeled these to start with. Right, so my finite length signal, if I went through all the mathematics of evaluating the numbers, and I'll do that next in MATLAB, and then plug them in and brought it back to the time domain, I'd end up with a signal that looked like this. And I plugged them into the synthesis equation. On the other hand, if I do this again with n equals 7, so now I'm going to compute it at more frequencies. Right? I'm going to take 7 samples in omega instead of just 5. These copies would all be shifted 7. Right? This would have been shifted to minus 7. This would have been shifted to plus 7. And they wouldn't overlap at all. Right? So when I finish that, I'd end up with just the original signal back. So by taking enough samples in frequency, I get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. By taking enough samples and frequency, I avoid the aliasing. So again, this one is a victim of time domain aliasing. And that aliasing was created because n equals 5 is less than the length of the signal, which is 7. But here, the number of samples and frequency is equal to the length of the signal, which is just enough to avoid aliasing, so that when I go through the Fourier transform, the copies don't overlap. So this is sort of just telling you with paper and pencil what would happen. I wouldn't want to do all this by hand with complex arithmetic, so I'm going to have MATLAB do it for me. So let's, uh, let's switch up here. And here. So here's my demo. I'm going to assume I have that rectangular pulse from 0 to 6 in time. And using tables in the book, we have its Fourier transform like this. And again, this is the number of ones in the original pulse, or I guess we could call this uh, maybe even more accurate for what we're doing the way I described it here. We'll call this M. And so for the first case, I'm going to define that X of 5, that what we get if I plug into this equation up here at 5 equally spaced points from zero, every 2 pi over 5. Um, and I'm going to do that, that, that sine, uh, sine M over, sine uh, M omega over 2 divided by sine omega over 2, is in the MATLAB uh, Dirichlet function, the Dirichlet kernel is called, with an extra factor of m. So I can use their library function instead of dealing with my own, which is helpful, as long as I remember I need to multiply by another m here. And then here's my e to the minus j 3 omega. 
right? So these are my omegas, and then I plug into this and invert it. Oh, I gotta go fix this one too before I run it. Whereas in the second example, I have seven sample, I'm gonna evaluate at seven frequencies. Evaluating the same equation, but I've got a different set of omegas now. Uh, IFFT is the, the inverse DFT. This is the numerical thing. I'm gonna, uh, it should be a real number because I've just started from a real equation. This is sort of just a sanity check where I'll print out the imaginary part, uh, the biggest part of the imaginary part to make sure it should be like 10 to the minus 16th, 10 to the minus 15th, so I can discard it as round off error and just keep the real part, and then I'll plot them both. So let's see how this runs. Did I make any typos? Don't think so. And so, oh, yeah, let me pull the uh, this window down just briefly. So when I ran it, oh, and here's my figure. It's just slow to arrive. When I ran the uh, equation, I can see these are those imaginary parts I just sort of had here as a diagnostic, and they're both really tiny, so that means I didn't make any silly uh, programming mistakes that, that would cause the imaginary part to be non-zero. That's just round off error. And now if I look at this, I can see this first one, oh, bad programming, didn't label my axes. So let me uh, do that quickly. This is my x5 of n. This is the alias version of n equals 5 less than n equals 7. And then uh, 5 n equals 7. This is the second version. Let's see. Uh, this is the not alias version. All right, so let me uh, get the window back up in front. So now that I have things properly labeled, you can see just as I predicted what happened when I do all the work numerically of plugging into the x of e to the j omega equation, then putting those values into the synthesis equation, which was IFFT, is, is what implements that here. I can see I get the five sa signals, five samples and frequency give me five values back in time, and they've overlapped. The rectangular pulses overlap the first two, and I get these two are two higher than the others. But when I have, and, and I've got them on the same time scale here just to make the comparison simpler, but when it's not aliased, we can see that when I go through all that work and come back, I get exactly the original seven non-zero values. So that's what I want. I want to make sure I have enough samples to avoid aliasing so that I can look at the Fourier transforms of this was just a simple toy signal. In the next video, I'll show you a, uh, a, a uh, example using a recorded audio sound and how we can look at, use the, this, this idea of, of sampling an omega to get a picture of the Fourier transform of, of real data. Okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, that's all for this video. I'll see you next time.